am Sean McQuillan, developer advocate for Android. I'm Manuel Bivo, I work in the Android Developer Relations team. And uh, we're going to be talking to you about testing coroutines. But before we talk about testing coroutines, let's talk a little bit about coroutines. So at I.O., we talked about how we're going to make uh, Android UI uh, coroutines first. And what does that actually mean? Like, what practically does that change about what we're doing while we're building the Android UI toolkit? So fundamentally, what that means is as we're building new APIs for Android, we're going to take a look at whether we can fit coroutines into them and whether that makes sense and provide a good coroutines support for the APIs we're building. We're also, as we build Jetpack libraries, we're going to use coroutines to build those libraries. We're already doing that with some of the Jetpack libraries we're working on now. Uh, so you're going to start seeing coroutines shipped in Kotlin first Jetpack libraries. Additionally, we're going to write documentation. I have put documentation up on developer.android.com to explain how to use coroutines and how to use coroutines as architecture components and other, uh, other parts of Android. Um, so at I.O., we talked about a bunch of different libraries that we're working on. Uh, and since then, uh, Four of them have made it to stable. So that's awesome. So we can, you can use Work Manager, Retrofit, Room, View Model, Scope. These all support coroutines out of the box in a stable version. Uh, the Live Data Builder, Lifecycle Scope, and When Started are all still in a release candidate state on the train to stable. And Colin X Coroutines Tests, the library we're going to be talking about today, is still experimental and it's on the train to stable as well. So to zoom in on testing coroutines, we need to define an application that we can actually test. So I'm going to go ahead and walk through how to add coroutines to an application that uses only Room, uh, just to kind of keep the app simple so we can focus in on the testing. Um, it's going to be just a, a simple to-do app that stores strings, and you can mark them as done. And I'm going to store this in a Room database. And to do that, um, I'm going to need to define an entity, like I would with any Room database. Uh, and there's no coroutines in your entity. It's still just an object you know, that holds a row for your database. Uh, but then we're going to add coroutines over in the DAO of our room. So here we can see where we're going to start integrating coroutines into kind of this room flow. Uh, we're going to go ahead and add a suspend modifier on one of our room queries. Uh, this time we're going to insert with the add item. And that makes this function main safe. It's now a suspend function, and room's going to run that query on a background thread. And it's going to run that on a custom dispatcher. Uh, it's actually going to be the same executor that Room uses if you use live data. Uh, and it uh, gets this other really cool superpower of it's cancelable. So if the coroutine that calls it cancels, it's now cancelable all the way down. Uh, we're also going to do the same thing. We're going to make a suspend function for fetching all the items here as well. Um, you could use flow for something like this as well, but I want to kind of keep this example simple so we can focus in on the testing part. Then going over to, oh, I have a little bit of code up here that's kind of questionable. But uh, I wanted to show real quick, uh, it is in fact main safe. You can make questionable architecture choices. And this is, this is now technically correct, which, as I like to say, is maybe the worst kind of correct. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go ahead and move on. We're going to make a repository that uses our DAO. Um, so we basically have to now make our first API decision. We have to like, actually figure out how to use coroutines uh, here. And one option that we have is we can make a suspend function like this. Uh, and that's very similar to what we did before. Or we could return a deferred right here. Uh, so this is kind of like a promise or a future, if you're familiar with that. But basically, it's an object that lets you say, I would like to get the result of this computation uh, later. And these are two different ways I could write this API, and I have to make a choice and decide which one I'm going to do here. And if I compare these two, uh, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways, and there's actually some big differences. Uh, so both of them basically require a suspend uh, function to call them. Uh, when you call the deferred version, uh, you don't technically need to be in a suspend context to call it, but to get a result from it, you later will. Uh, the suspend version does support that auto cancellation feature that's like super cool and awesome and like magical coroutines, Kotlin stuff. Uh, and the deferred version does not. Um, both of them are main safe. Like there's absolutely no difference in the threading behavior between these two implementations. But the threading behavior does get quite different when we look at how we get the results out. So deferreds have this callback called invoke on completion, which just gets called on any old thread, and you have no control over that. And it becomes really difficult to actually use that to get a result out uh, if you're not in a suspend function. So uh, generally, in Kotlin, uh, you should prefer to expose suspend functions just as many times as you can. Like, that's just the place where you should kind of default. 
Um, and then we're going to go over to our view model and finish out this flow for adding an item to our to-do list. So the view model is kind of the natural owner of this work because it's the thing that kind of owns the work that's happening. So that's why I'm going to actually launch the coroutine. Um, this launch call right here actually creates a new coroutine, which then allows me to call the suspend functions that I just created. And then I can use the result right away right, right here without having to define a callback, which is kind of like the superpower of coroutines right there. So there's kind of three basic rules that we like walk through as we were going through that code. Uh, so as you're designing code with coroutines, like prefer to expose suspend functions as your primitive API choice. Like try not to return a bunch of deferreds or, or build complicated interfaces that are, are harder than that, um, unless you have really good reason to go for other interfaces. Uh, have whatever the natural owner of the work is that, that like kind of contains the, the life cycle of that work be the thing that launches it. And um, just kind of like learn to trust that main safety is going to work. Um, this is something to, I've seen a lot of code as people like come into coroutines and they'll like uh, start like with contexting like five times on the way to actually calling a database call. Uh, it's just like trust that it's going to work and you know, it, it does. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I really have to talk about for this basic coroutine slow. And I'm going to pass it over to Manuel who's going to talk about sure. testing. Thank you, Sean. Testing is an integral part of the app development process, but I don't want to spend that much time about it, so TLDR, test your code. <laughs> uh, we are going to focus on unit testing in this talk. So how can we define a good unit test? Good unit test should be fast. You shouldn't have to wait for it, for it to fail or pass. And it should be reliable, always give you the same result. Then it should be isolated as well. So execution of unit tests should be independent from each other. And obviously, after the test finishes, no other work should be running. So as we said, we are going to see how to test coroutines and the code that we showed before. So when testing coroutines, I would like uh, to ask yourself, is the test that I am creating now triggering the execution of a new coroutine? If that's the case, it's because you are likely calling launch or async in code under test. If that's not the case, it's because you are probably testing a suspend function that doesn't create a new coroutine. And if nothing of this happens, it's run a testing coroutine, so we are leaving it out. So they broadly fall, a test is broadly going to fall into one of these two categories. So FYI, as uh, Sean said before, we're gonna be using the test, the Kotlin X coroutine test library, and it's an experimental. Keeping up today should be relatively straightforward on the road to stable, so we don't worry that much about it. Cool, so we're gonna see how to test suspend functions now, and specifically the repo layer. Repo layer, as we said, uh, is supposed to expose suspend functions. Now we're going to see this insert to do, which is basically adding an item to the DAO. How can we test this? This is a suspend function, and it's to run inside a coroutine. And for that, we can use the method run blocking test, which is the method from the test library that we just mentioned. Run blocking test is going to create a new coroutine, and it's going to allow you to execute suspend functions immediately. And you might have heard of run blocking in the past. What is the difference? with run blocking test. Well, run blocking test is gonna skip uh, delays, so you don't have to waste extra time in your tests. How can we use run blocking test in our tests? Basically, you just have to grab your test body inside this method, run blocking test, and that would be it. So if we go through the test, you will see we are creating our web subject, our repo, then we are calling the suspend function insert to do. We can do that because we are inside a coroutine, and now that insert to do function is gonna be executed immediately. So therefore, now we can assert that the item was added. That was easy, right? Things get complicated now with tests that are going to trigger new coroutines. So we're gonna focus on how to test the view model layer. So now here we have add item, which is a regular function. It's not a suspend function. That is going to create a new coroutine. This is executed with the view model scope, which actually uses the dispatchers.main uh, as a default dispatcher. And here we are just calling, uh, just to simplify everything, calling the repo with a text, something we want to add. Can we use the technique that we just saw before? So just grabbing our test body inside run blocking test. So if you do this, it is going to fail. Why? We're gonna see this in a second. So if we had to visualize what's happening in the different threads, you will see that the, the test body is gonna be executed in the test thread. But as soon as you call bmodelscope.launch, that code, it's going to execute in a different thread. And so the, the test thread is going to keep on running, and the test assertions are going to likely going to fail because 
still other code might be running in, in other threads. So this is not an option. We cannot use run blocking test uh, as it is. What if we take run blocking test out of the equation, we want to make it simple, and we just wait for something to be there? For example, you can use uh, Mokito await if you're using Mokito or any kind of other testing framework. But here, what we really are doing is that the code is still running, the, the coding code is still running on a different thread. But we are blocking the test thread just to wait for something to be there. So this might be okay in some scenarios, don't get me wrong, but this test doesn't fail fast. And so even if it passes, it is gonna add an extra overhead time for every single test that you run. So your test suite is gonna be overall slower. So as I said, this is okay, but we can do better. So actually what we want, it's a test that are gonna pay, pass or fail fast, that's clear, and we want them to be deterministic when running coroutines. So we want to remove that randomness from the test to make it reliable. What can we use? We have a class in the library which is called test coroutine dispatcher. This is just a regular dispatcher, but it's a fake one. And it's gonna allow you to control the execution of the coroutines when you are doing tests. And so, how can we use test coroutine dispatcher? We said before that a view model scope is using dispatcher's domain. So somehow we have to replace it. But to be honest, dispatcher's domain is not even available in unit test. So you shouldn't you couldn't use it anyway if you wanted to. And this is because dispatcher's domain uses the um, Android uh, main looper to access some code. And so that's available in instrumentation tests, but not in unit tests. So we need to replace it by a test code within dispatcher. How can we do that? So for every test class, you will have to add some code like this, whereas you are gonna declare a variable, a test dispatcher, and then before running every single test, you are gonna overwrite the dispatcher's domain with this method, dispatcher.setMain. And then after the test, you are gonna reset everything that you did, and then clean up the test code in dispatcher. This just makes sure that no other work is running after the test finishes. So this is a lot of boilerplate code to add to every single test class. So you can extract this out and put it in a JUnit rule, and then we can have something like this. So now we are in our to-do view model test. We define our main coroutine rule with the code that we just uh, saw before. And how can we use it? So we said before we have the run blocking test. Test dispatcher, the test coroutine dispatcher, also allows you to call run blocking test. But with the difference that we had before is that now, every single coroutine that gets started with this test dispatcher is gonna execute immediately. So that's pretty handy for us. So now, uh, you can make it shorter if you want, if you don't want that boilerplate code. So you can say coroutine rule from login test, create an extension term function, be imaginative, you uh, code in power. <laughs> you can, yeah, go crazy with Kyle and make that an apply function right there. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so if we see what's happening now, if we visualize that with the threading that we saw before, you will see that now, run blocking test, in reality, it's gonna create a new coroutine and everything is gonna be executed there. So this is gonna create a new coroutine, the test body is gonna get executed, view model scope dot launch is gonna be executed immediately there, and then by the time the test assertions come, all the work that the, the coroutine started is finished, so we're good to go. But what if you don't use dispatcher's domain? Now imagine that in our view model, we want to do some formatting in dispatchers.default um, just before adding that to the repo. So can we use just the uh, rule run blocking test? You're gonna have the same problem. That, that coroutine is gonna be executed in a different thread, and so the test assertions are likely go going to fail. And this is because we hard coded dispatchers.default in the code, and that's not a pretty good practice for testing. So what we recommend is that you should always inject dispatchers. So how can we do that? For example, go and watch the VI talk, <laughs> a pretty good one. And so in our view model, uh, what we can do is that pass the a default dispatcher as a parameter. And what that default dispatcher later on will be ex, uh, used to execute the view model scope uh, launch. And in this case, like obviously in production, you will still be using dispatchers.default, but now in test, what we can do is passing uh, the test dispatcher from the coroutine rule in our view model. And if, do the, if we do this, we'll get the expected result, and the, the coroutine that we started is gonna be executed immediately. This is not the only thing you can do with test coroutine dispatcher, and Sean is gonna tell you more about it. 
So I know we're all awaiting the end of this conference, so let's kind of get through this section. Um, but let's see, let's see kind of these three bullet points that Manuel had earlier, and let's dive into these and talk about some of the features of Test Care and Dispatcher and the other parts of the uh, library. Uh, so we started with we want to make tests that run fast. Uh, I mean, who loves waiting for long test suites that take half an hour to run? Is that? No, nobody. Oh, whoa, oh, there's a person up there. Yes, one person. We should chat. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so we all want our test suite to run fast. Like milliseconds is awesome, seconds is good, minutes, okay. Um, like that's what we're aiming for here. Um, and so the big thing that Test Care Routine Dispatcher kind of helps you with here, and run blocking tests kind of work together on this, uh, is it gives you this delay and timeout uh, behavior. Uh, so this lets you basically auto-progress time as uh, from your test uh, in the coroutines context. So if there's like a delay or a timeout in your test, you can trigger that immediately or instantly in your test execution instead of having to actually wait a second or five seconds for that timeout to happen. Um, in practical test code, this is typically used for testing timeouts. Like that's the reason that you would actually end up calling these functions explicitly. Um, but it's nice to have that feature available. Uh, it's also kind of fast from like things that it helps you do as a programmer, because the other cost to writing tests is that you have to write the tests. Uh, so one thing that it does is it returns unit, so you can uh, just apply it, uh, say my test equals run blocking test, uh, which is nice because if you use run blocking, it returns the last value of the lambda, and then JUnit4 won't run it. Uh, so that's a pretty like nice thing. Uh, every single part of the library is injectable. So there's test care routine dispatcher, there's test care routine scope, uh, and you can inject either of those depending on your architecture and how you need it to work with your application. Um, and it's also extensible. Um, the whole library is like designed from the beginning to be test framework agnostic. Uh, so it doesn't have a dependency on JUnit 4.12. Uh, so whatever dependency of JUnit you have in your builds uh, is gonna be fine. Uh, it also, uh, you know, it's gonna work with JUnit 5 and it's gonna work with your custom test runner. Uh, the other thing we want from our test suites uh, uh, is we want them to be reliable. We either want them to either always fail uh, because things are broken, or we want them to always pass uh, because things are not broken. Uh, we typically don't want them to fail one out of 10 times. And like, you know you've hit this when like, you're like, oh, the build failed, let me run that again. And that's like the first thing you do. Uh, and so like, when you get in that situation, you wanna like, spend some time on, on code quality and test quality. And this library helps you when you're doing coroutines in a couple ways. Um, so the big one, uh, really, these two kind of work together, is it gives you explicit control over your coroutine execution. Uh, and it does that by like kind of transforming what was fundamentally a very asynchronous activity, running a bunch of things on different threads and joining them all over the place and doing a bunch of concurrency, and turning it into a deterministic process that should execute the same way every single time. And so we can kind of visualize that a little bit, right? So let's imagine this is uh, the order of coroutine execution in uh, one of my tests. So I've written a test using run blocking tests, and the coroutines execute A, then B, then C, then D, then E. And then I check this in, I put it into my continuous integration, and the test runs again and again. And each time it's running this coroutine in the same order. And because it's deterministic, I know that until I either change the code or I change that test, it's gonna keep passing, which is lovely, because I'm gonna only get signal when it fails. Uh, if I didn't have deterministic behavior here, uh, I could end up in a situation where, click, uh, where I ended up getting a different order. And this different order may not work with the assertions I made or the fakes I have or some part of my test code, because you know it's test code, I just kind of like put it together, it's not production code. Um, and so it's gonna, you know, it's gonna fail and I'm gonna get a flaky build and I'm just gonna hit that rebuild button. And so that's why I prefer determinism when I'm testing concurrency, uh, especially down in that specific level. Um, and then the other big thing for this dispatcher is it's possible. Uh, so this is like a huge thing. Uh, so it does this immediate uh, execution, uh, but which is very much the exact same thing that dispatchers on confined does. Uh, however, since it's possible, it allows you to basically undo that and like actually execute coroutines in a much more realistic fashion than either one. Um, so immediate execution is awesome for 90, 95% of tests that you write but it's actually an order that can never happen in production. So sometimes you need it to not happen, and that's when you need to pause the dispatcher to write that last five or 10% of tests. Uh, and then it helps you write isolated tests, and the big thing there is it looks for coroutine leaks at the end of the run blocking test lambda, uh, and if you call that cleanup test coroutine, um, it's gonna go ahead and make sure that you didn't leak a coroutine into your next test suite, which writes to the database, and then your test fails one out of 10 times. So it helps you with this situation right there. 
Um, and it also tries really hard, and not always successfully, but it tries, to put the uncaught exceptions into the test that caused the uncaught exception and caused that test to fail instead of the test suite a thousand tests later. Uh, so go check out Kotlin X coroutines test. Uh, coroutines are awesome. We love them on Android. And that's because this graph. <laughs> <laughs> As you can clearly see on this graph, <laughs> as you go into more complex code, the axis goes up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming to Android Dev Summit. <laughs> <laughs>